Hey, so I've got merch now. Uh, if you're interested in the Killful Dinosaur shirt or hoodie or long sleeve, check out the top link in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Dinosaur cinema is something that really needs no introduction. It's had quite the history starting in the early 1900s and still unsurprisingly going on today. During that time, there's been both a lot of bumps and achievements along the way which have resulted in a lot of different types of dinosaur films, some of them being unique and different for the time period, others being revolutionary for the film industry, and of course others being shameless knockoffs just trying to capitalize off of the more popular titles, and so many more. Due to this variety, along with dinosaur movies just being interesting as a whole, it's resulted in this amazing iceberg chart made by Duncaster on icebergcharts.com that I will be covering today. I've actually had this specific iceberg in the back burner for a while now. I meant to actually cover it months ago, like late last year, but ended up putting it to the side as it was just too big of a project to get through at the time. I went as far as even finishing up the script for it, but I never got around to finishing the recording. So I figured since I finished the Paleontology Fringe Theories Iceberg, why not come back to this video and do something a bit more low-key and not as research intensive. So without further ado, let's check out the Dinosaur Movie Iceberg. Jurassic Park Series the Jurassic Park series is currently a six-movie franchise that's based around genetically engineered dinosaurs being put in a theme park that's located on an island known as Isla Nublar, and are exploited in a number of different ways, only for it to backfire horribly, leading to the dinosaurs' eventual escape and wreaking havoc onto the park guests. The franchise has a bit of an interesting yet rocky history. The first movie was based on a 1990 book by Michael Crichton, which which after being adapted into a movie, did so well that the movie's director, Steven Spielberg, pressured Crichton to write another book to continue the series, which would lead to the Lost World movie. Of course, with the success of both of these movies, it would eventually lead to a third one, but at this point, Crichton was pretty much done with the franchise, so the people behind the camera continued the Jurassic Park series their own way. After part three, the franchise would go through a 14-year period of several ideas being tossed around for a possible possible Jurassic Park 4. Not much came from these ideas, but finally in 2015, the franchise would be revived and rebranded to the now Jurassic World trilogy. This trilogy follows a more overarching storyline following the main characters of Owen Grady and Claire Deering, as they go through a lot of different adventures throughout the newest trilogy, including dinosaur hybrids, the dinosaurs being taken off of the island and put onto the mainland, and even a weird plot involving locusts in the third and final part. Despite the turbulence this series has gone through, it still managed to keep up its success and fanbase to this day. In fact, from what I've heard, the series has plans for a whole nother trilogy, along with already having a few different spin-offs in the form of shows, books, and short films. It seems like the Jurassic Park series is showing no signs of stopping anytime soon. The Lost World 1925 1925's The Lost World is a dinosaur movie from the silent film era and is a movie adaptation of the famous book by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle that goes by the same name. The movie is about a group of people who go on an expedition to the Amazon to confirm that dinosaurs are still alive. And what they find when they get there are, you guessed it, dinosaurs. During their time in this new world, which is a plateau that contains prehistoric life, they run into various different threats and eventually even bring one of the dinosaurs back home with them. This sauropod dinosaur eventually breaks loose and wreaks havoc before making its way out of the city. The Lost World has a lot of notable things about it that makes it significant and important to the world of film, but one of the most notable things about it is how it brings its array of dinosaurs to life using stop-motion animation, which was done by the one and only Willis O'Brien. In fact, it's considered to be the first feature-length film to use special effects to this degree. Disney's Dinosaur Disney's Dinosaur is an animated kids movie that's focused around an iguanodon named Aladar who grew up with a family of lemurs. After their home gets destroyed in a meteor shower, Aladar and the rest of his lemur family have to join a herd of herbivorous dinosaurs in their journey to find their nesting grounds, which offers the sanctuary and food they need in order to survive. 
Of course, this isn't an easy journey, as they're crossing a hot desert environment with large Carnotauruses following them. It's a fun and simple family-friendly movie with talking dinosaurs that has a pretty interesting history behind it. Initially, Disney's dinosaur was going to be much different than what we actually got. It has a pretty long production history that began all the way back in the mid-80s, but to summarize, the idea was conceived by Phil Tippett, who had wanted to make a feature-length dinosaur movie for a while at this point. His idea was that it was going to be something more serious and gritty, but also educational in a sense. His idea was going to be something similar to that of a previous dinosaur project he did, a 1985 short film called Prehistoric Beast. Tippett envisioned the movie to be set right before the extinction of the dinosaurs, and the story would focus on showing the more brutal and realistic nature of the animals. He was going to make this film as a way to educate people through entertainment, but finding a studio that was for this idea was difficult. Eventually, the idea was brought to Disney, who ended up having budgetary concerns despite them seemingly liking the idea, because Tippett figured the special effects would all be done through stop-motion animation. This was around the early 90s, so Jurassic Park was becoming a thing, and Disney wanted to wait until that came out to see how it would change the scene of the film industry. And when they saw its success, they decided to hop on the bandwagon as well, but as you'd probably already expect, this was just part of Dinosaur's rocky development history. History. It's a lot to get into, so I won't go too in-depth with it. It might be its own video one day because it is an interesting story, but I'll leave it here for now. The Land Before Time series. The Land Before Time series is a children's animated movie franchise that follows the main characters Littlefoot, Sarah, Spike, Ducky, and Petrie in their many crazy adventures in this 14 movie series, not to mention its spin-off shows. I, probably like some of you, am only familiar with the first movie directed by Don Bluth, which is about Littlefoot and his friends having to find their way to the Great Valley after they are separated from their families during a violent earthquake. Along the way, they have to avoid the movie's main villain, the Sharp Tooth or the Tyrannosaurus Rex. While I can't speak on the rest of the films as I haven't seen them, I do remember the first one having some very serious moments within them that felt very genuine and rather dark for a kid's movie. 2013's Walking with Dinosaurs Walking with Dinosaurs is a family film centered around talking Pachyrhinosauruses in the Cretaceous period. It was named after the successful documentary miniseries with the same name, but aside from that, there wasn't really any other similarities between the two. 2013's Walking with Dinosaurs had voice acting in it and was based only in one setting and one time period. The movie is a coming-of-age story about Patchy, a young Pachyrhinosaurus, whose story we follow to adulthood, where he journeys through the Cretaceous Wild, avoiding threats like Gorgosauruses, which serve as the film's main dinosaur villain, quote-unquote. The movie itself had some pretty decent CG work on it from what I remember, and it seems like they were trying to keep up with an up-to-date and scientifically accurate dinosaur depiction, but didn't do that well in certain areas, apparently. Dinosaur fans weren't very happy with a lack of feathers on the Gorgosaurus, which instead had iridescent scales. But this wouldn't be the only reason why the movie isn't held in very high regard. That would also be due to the poorly executed narrative and very bad dialogue. In fact, some people weren't very happy at the presence of voices at all, to the point where there was a version of the film called the Cretaceous Cut that completely cut out all of the voiceovers. This version of the film was released as a bonus feature when it was eventually released on home media. The Velocipaster. There is only one other dinosaur movie in this world that can surpass Jurassic Park in literally everything. That movie is Velocipaster, an action-packed adventure about a priest who obtains the power to turn into a velociraptor after being infected by an ancient relic from China. And now he has to fight off ninjas and drug dealers with his prostitute love interest. Yes, this is a real movie. Yes, it is my favorite movie in the whole world. Yes, I definitely think you should watch it. Yes, this is a B-movie. How could you tell? Godzilla series. Godzilla is one of the longest running and most famous monster film franchises in the world. It got its start all the way back in 1954 with its dark and depressing story of the titular monster's representation of nuclear war and the devastating outcome it's had from the perspective of the Japanese. This would be continued with over 30 films and counting which feature Godzilla, a radioactive sea monster, battling several kaiju opponents and causing mass destruction in the process. 
Godzilla and his monster allies and enemies are mainly displayed on screen as people in heavy rubber costumes, and the design for Godzilla himself was a culmination of three different dinosaurs, which were Stegosaurus, Iguanodon, and of course, Tyrannosaurus Rex. I actually am not that well versed with the Godzilla lore and don't really know which movies connect with each other. I know there are different series from different eras, but I haven't really taken the time to explore or watch them. But based on my surface level research, the eras are categorized as followed. There's the Showa era, which ranged from the original 1954 film to films that featured all the way up to 1975. There's the Heisei era, where Toho decided to reboot the series by only following the continuity of the original 1954 film and ignoring the rest of the movies that followed in the Showa era. Then there's the Millennium Era, which basically did the same thing, except the continuity is all over the place as not all of the movies in this era necessarily follow a single storyline, and some only serve as standalone films. And finally, there's the Reiwa Era, which is the most current one that consists of the Shin Godzilla movie, the Godzilla anime trilogy, trilogy, and the current MonsterVerse movies, which all seem to have their own unique stories and continuities from my understanding. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is a science fiction film that's about a fictional dinosaur that's awakened in the Arctic Circle after a nuclear bomb test disturbs its dormant state. This fictional dinosaur, which is called the Redosaurus, makes its way towards the US East Coast, causing mass destruction and battling military troops in the typical monster movie fashion. The movie has a weird history as there have been conflicting accounts of how its development came to be. Luckily, I have the dinosaur filmography by Mark F. Berry, which puts all of these different accounts together as best as possible. According to this book, there were a couple of movie producers looking to make a few monster movies, one of them initially titled The Monster from Beneath the Sea. It's then stated that the producers and or their team ran across a story on an American magazine called The Saturday Morning Post, which was titled The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, and was written by famous sci-fi author Ray Bradbury and they had bought the rights to his story to add his name to their movie. Bradbury's account of the story, however, is a bit different. Apparently, he was approached by the producers to read their script for The Monster from Beneath the Sea, and the rights for his story were bought only after he pointed out the similarities between the script and his story. There were other accounts and sides to the story, but at one point, even Ray Harryhausen, who did the special effects for the movie, had stated that there were so many rumors about the movie from behind the scenes that it's hard to tell what's true and what isn't. And even he states that the movie couldn't have been completely inspired by Bradbury's short story because the early idea and outline for the monster from beneath the sea was developed before Bradbury's short story was featured in the magazine. And then searching around the internet, I had heard that it seemed Bradbury kind of knew what the producers were going for here, you know, trying to use his name for the film to increase its popularity. So he ended up pulling what I guess we would now call a pro gamer move and changed the title of his short story from The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms to The Foghorn. The short story is a very sad tale about a lonely monster that's attracted to the sounds of the foghorn from a lighthouse isolated on the east coast, which inadvertently tricks the monster into thinking it's found another of its kind. It's a pretty sad story, but the movie seems like it's going for a completely different tone. The Good Dinosaur the Good Dinosaur is an animated kids film that takes place in an alternate universe where the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs missed Earth completely. The story takes place millions of years after this and follows a timid apatosaurus named Arlo who's trying to prove himself to his family by being brave or something. Anyways, along the way he befriends a cave boy and they go on a crazy adventure together. It's, it's not that deep of a movie really. In fact, this movie is actually the final product of years of planning and development hell. Initially, the movie was going to explore the modern representation of dinosaurs and their stereotypes, at least this was the initial director's intention, who was Bob Peterson, but he ended up getting removed from the project due to issues with the story and was replaced with a different director who, I guess, took the idea and went in a slightly different direction with it. In the end, the movie was a box office bomb and has received mixed to poor reviews and to this day, it's not very liked. 
1933's King Kong. King Kong is one of the most famous monster movies who debuted in his 1933 original film, which had a simple but engaging premise. The story follows a film crew traveling overseas for their next production project before coming within range of an unexplored island known as Skull Island, which they decide to explore. Here, not only do they find Kong, they find several other prehistoric threats. After the lead actress is kidnapped by the island's inhabitants and given to Kong as a sacrifice, the rest of the group attempt to save her and manage to do so, along with capturing Kong himself. They take him back to the States, where they plan to exploit him for profits, only for this to backfire. Kong escapes, we get the famous Empire State Building scene, which leads to Kong's unfortunate death. The movie is notable for its beauty and the beast themes, its amazing special effects work that brought the island's residents to life via stop motion, and its several iconic scenes that have been replicated time and time again. Due to this, the film is considered to be historically and culturally significant even by the Library of Congress. 2005's King Kong There have been several iterations of King Kong since its 1933 release, but the 2005 one directed by Peter Jackson is probably the best one out there next to the original. 2005's King Kong is a remake of the 1933 film, which uses its predecessor as a blueprint to recreate the story that so many people fell in love with and ended up adding a lot more to it. At its core, the story is pretty much the same as the original 1933 movie, but there are so many more layers added to the setting of the film which delivers in making the island and its inhabitants much more intimidating. In this version, the dinosaurs, along with pretty much all of the other creatures on the island, are actually fictional and are made to be descendants from real-life dinosaurs, which is a pretty clever way of incorporating them into the story. And in the story, there's a lot more fast-paced action sequences that were brought to life using updated special effects like CGI. Overall, it's a pretty neat movie. 2008's Journey to the Center of the Earth I don't really know why this particular version of Journey to the Center of the Earth is on this list. It's not so much a dinosaur movie as it is a movie that just has a dinosaur in it. As weird as that sounds, there is a major difference between the two. Anyways, the 2008 version of Journey to the Center of the Earth, which was originally a book written by Jules Verne in 1864, centers around Brendan Fraser's character who travels to Iceland with his nephew to meet their guide that's going to take them down a cave system that leads them to the center of the earth. What they find there is a lost world that is the home of different prehistoric fauna of which only one seems to be an actual dinosaur, which is a Giganotosaurus apparently. Anyways, there's really not much to say about this movie, it was definitely an iteration of Journey to the Center of the Earth, which was followed by a weird sequel that starred Dwayne Johnson called Journey to the Mysterious Island, most likely a reference to another one of Jules Verne's books also titled The Mysterious Island. The Valley of Guanji. The Valley of Guanji is one of the few dinosaur films that are also considered to be part of the Western genre. The film itself has had quite the complicated backstory, but it started out as an idea that Willis O'Brien was playing around with during the early 40s as he was interested in making a cowboy dinosaur movie. I hate to gloss over the story of a very well-noted movie in dinosaur film history, but there's just a lot to it and it could easily be its own video, which I might just do because the last video I did on the history of the dinosaur western genre. Some of the information in that video is incorrect anyway, so I might need to revisit that. But the gist of what you need to know is that this movie was originally conceived by Willis O'Brien in the early 1940s. This idea of his came in several different iterations that were constantly shelved, brought back, had its name changed, and were picked up by a few different names before eventually being brought back by Ray Harryhausen, who came on as a producer for the movie, and it would be officially titled The Valley of Guanji, and made it at least close to what O'Brien had envisioned. The movie is based around a group of cowboys and showrunners that stumble upon an uncharted region called the Forbidden Valley. Within 
Within this valley reside several different prehistoric animals and dinosaurs that the group tries to capture so that they can exploit them for their show and make money off of these rare creatures. However, one of these dinosaurs is Guanji, an aggressive and deadly Allosaurus. The film is structured similar to that of King Kong where they take the dinosaur back with them as they think it'll be great for their show, only for it to break free and wreak havoc. Carnosaur Series the Carnosaur series is a trilogy of B-movies centered around genetically engineered dinosaurs created by a mad scientist that uses chickens to breed them, and she also created a virus containing dinosaur DNA that will be used to impregnate women with dinosaurs that will burrow their way out of their bodies and run around and destroy the human race. The movie continues with two more sequels and two spin-off films. I'm not actually sure if these are really spin-off films, they mainly just reuse footage from the previous Carnosaur movies, but I digress. The first of these movies was released in 1993, most likely as a way to capitalize off of Jurassic Park, which had released in the same year. However, Carnosaurs in a way actually predated the Jurassic franchise, as the source material for it was a book by the same name that was written by John Brosnan. There's actually a bit of a story behind this that makes me feel kind of bad for Brosnan. Basically, he was approached by associates of the filmmaker Roger Corman, a name that you will be seeing a few times in this iceberg as this man was involved with a few dinosaur related projects who wanted to buy the rights to Brosnan's book to make a movie adaptation of it and have him do the screenplay for it. And understandingly, Brosnan was excited to hear this and accepted the deal. Brosnan sent an outline but then got news back that the budget for the film would only be $1 million. Brosnan thought that he would maybe need to dial back the presence of dinosaurs in his final draft, but Corman was insistent that he writes whatever he wanted, and Corman would just make changes later in the film's production. Suspicious, yet still willing to do it, Brosnan sent in the final draft and was kept completely out of the loop during the production of the movie. Eventually, the movie would be released and Brosnan did not at all like the adaptation, straight up calling it a crap film. And he's not entirely wrong. Theodore Rex. Well, if it isn't my old arch nemesis, Theodore Rex. Oh boy, here we go again. Theodore Rex is a weird ass movie that takes place in an alternate future world where dinosaurs and people are coexisting. The dinosaurs were created by the humans and are now intelligent and advanced enough to talk and drive cars and shit. It's weird. The movie's very weird, but one good thing I'll say about it is that it had some decent practical effects done for it. The movie follows Whoopi Goldberg's character, who's a cop, and her partner Theodore, who's a T-Rex in case you couldn't tell, and they have to work together to solve of a couple of murders. The best known thing about this film is literally how bad it was due to its very rocky development history and the tense relationship between the filmmakers and Whoopi Goldberg, as she was essentially forced to do this movie after breaching her verbal contract of agreeing to be a part of it. It led to a lawsuit that she ended up having to settle on and did the movie with a not so great performance. There's a lot to the history of Theodore Rex, so much so I made an entire video recounting its development. It's a pretty good video if I do say so myself, and I highly recommend it if you want to know more about the behind the scenes of Theodore Rex. But I talk about it enough in that video, I don't want to talk about it that much here. Tammy and the T-Rex Tammy and the T-Rex is yet another weird dinosaur movie that people have been wanting me to talk about on my channel for a while now. And I guess it kind of makes sense. It's it's a very it's it's a very weird movie. So basically, it's about this girl named Tammy whose boyfriend Michael is essentially murdered by her jealous ex-boyfriend or at least put in a comatose state after he's thrown into a lion pen at the zoo where he's mauled almost to death. Meanwhile, a crazy mad scientist who has a robot T-Rex is looking to find a human brain to put inside of it so that it can become sentient. He finds out about Michael's comatose state and just kind of hijacks the brain, you know, as you do, and just puts it inside his robot T-Rex, which is now sentient. And I guess Tammy is in love with it now, I don't fucking know. We're Back, A Dinosaur Story. We're Back is a 1993 animated kids film based on a kids book by the same name. 
In this movie, three dinosaurs and a pteranodon are brought back from the past by a scientist who's determined to show people real-life dinosaurs. He also has the technological powers to increase their intelligence so that they're able to talk and, you know, not kill a bunch of people in the streets. The scientist's plan is to send the dinosaurs back to the present to meet up with a guide that's going to lead them to the Natural History Museum, but of course things don't go as planned and they go on an adventure instead. The movie was was produced by Amblimation, which is a subsidiary of Amblin Entertainment and was formed by Steven Spielberg, who was working on another dinosaur movie, Jurassic Park, which released in the same year as this movie. 1960s The Lost World the 1960s Lost World is another adaptation of the 1912 book, but is more loose than some of the other versions out there. The base story is pretty much the same, where a group of people travel to the Amazon basin to discover a plateau that holds a hidden world of prehistoric animals along with other threats. While the previous adaptation utilized stop-motion special effects to bring their dinosaurs to life, this movie's methods were a bit more problematic, because they instead decided to use a method that I also talked about more in depth in its own video, which was the practice of using live animals and movies to pass them off as dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures. Movies that used this method would be given the informal name of Slurposaurs, which we're going to see a lot of in this video, unfortunately. In this movie's case, these live animals were an iguana, monitor lizards, and an alligator. And as if that wasn't already bad enough, these animals had props glued onto them to give them a more prehistoric look, and some of the animals were even pitted against each other during the movie. Baby, Secret of the Lost Legend this movie was like a fever dream for me. I watched this movie when I was younger and only remembered bits and parts of it. It was one of those things that just kind of randomly pops back into your head every now and again. But the thing is, I never got the name of the film back when I first watched it, so a part of me wondered if it even really existed or if it was just something my brain was making up. But now I can confirm this film does exist and it's uh, it's kind of a strange one. This movie, Baby Secret of the Lost Legend, creates a story around the popular real life African legend Mikele Mbembe. For those of you that don't know, basically it goes that a water dwelling animal or even a spiritual entity of some kind resides somewhere in the Congo River Basin. It's often depicted as a large long necked beast that's herbivorous but also very aggressive. These characteristics align with that of a sauropod dinosaur, and in this particular movie, that's how they depict it as. In Baby, Secret of the Lost Legend, it involves a married couple who travel through the African jungles to try and find evidence of this legend. And they do manage to locate a family of them, a male, a female, and their offspring, most likely the last of their kind living peacefully away from human life. Unfortunately, things for them get interrupted when the local military get involved and attempt to kill and or capture them. The couple are able to escape with the offspring before he can get captured and now have to find a way to rescue its mother. What's interesting about this movie is that it was actually produced by Walt Disney Studios, but it hasn't aged all that well, at least from the last time I watched it. And that's probably one of the reasons why this film has pretty mid to low reviews on it. Caveman Caveman is a comedy film about a caveman played by Ringo Starr, you know, the drummer for the Beatles, a former rock band from the 60s, after he is kicked out of his tribe and joins a misfit group of cave people who go on an adventure and run into prehistoric animals along the way. It seems like a weird movie with a lot of slapstick comedy in it, but it does feature some cool stop motion special effects for the dinosaurs in it, which was mostly done by Jim Danforth, who ended up leaving the film partway through due to issues on how he would be credited for it. Apparently, he wanted to be credited as a co-director, but due to some weird rule or complication from the Directors Guild of America, he wasn't going to even though his contract said otherwise. Because of this, he was only credited for works he did in regards to the special effects. A Sound of Thunder a Sound of Thunder takes place in the not-so-far future where a company known as Time Safari Inc. 
offers a time traveling service to the wealthy to give them a chance to go back in time and hunt dinosaurs. For this to work and not alter the present, there are strict rules and regulations set up, but after someone steps on a butterfly during one of these safaris, it causes ripples through time, so our main characters now have to go back in time to prevent the situation from happening. The movie is based on a short story from Ray Bradbury by the same name, which was released back in 1952. Now you're probably wondering, if the smallest change can alter the present, then why are people hunting full-on dinosaurs? Well, according to the short story, at least, only dinosaurs who were going to die moments anyways and have been calculated to have very little effect on the future are the ones that the hunters are allowed to hunt. The Land That Time Forgot the Land That Time Forgot takes place during World War I, and our main characters are on a ship that gets torpedoed by a German U-boat that they end up hijacking and using to get home. But with low fuel, they are forced to go off course and come across a fictional landmass known as Caprona. Here, dinosaurs and primitive man still roam, and now our characters have to survive this new prehistoric world until they can find a way off of it. The movie is based on the Edgar Rice Burroughs book with the same name that was written in 1918, but the movie loosely follows the events from the book. One thing that it does a little differently is explain how things actually evolve in Caprona. Not through the traditional way of natural selection, but rather the more north the survivors go in, the more advanced the prehistoric species get. Overall, not that bad of a movie, but not that great either. As far as the dinosaurs go, the use of stop motion was not an option, so the filmmakers and production team used puppets instead. With several dog-sized prehistoric animals constructed from the movie, including Allosaurus, Styracosaurus, Plesiosaurus, and many more. The Last Dinosaur The Last Dinosaur is a Japanese-American production brought together by the companies Subaraya Productions and Rankin Bass Productions, and it was distributed domestically by Warner Brothers Television Distribution and internationally by Toho. Together, the two had concocted this weird dinosaur movie about a big game hunter who owns a company that drills into the polar ice caps for oil deposits. But on one of these expeditions, a group of people accidentally end up drilling into a hidden world containing dinosaurs. But no one from that initial expedition made it out alive with the exception of one person. So our big game hunter main character decides to go down there himself with a new group of people willing to go with him and they explore the world for themselves. They run into all kinds of prehistoric creatures, including a pterosaur, a prehistoric rhino that they confuse for a ceratopsian dinosaur, and an inconsistently sized Tyrannosaurus rex that sometimes has Godzilla roars. All things considered, it's actually a fun film in some parts that has a lot of unintentionally funny moments. And unlike a lot of these other movies on this list, this was one of the few that utilized the man in suit method for most of their dinosaurs. Age of Dinosaurs this is my personal favorite low-budget dinosaur movie ever. It is such a garbage movie, but it's so unintentionally funny in so many ways. What's in four? Layering. Plus, hate me if you want, but I like the concept of dinosaurs destroying a city. Anyways, the movie is about a biotech company that genetically engineers dinosaurs and recreates them for the purpose of profiting off of them, I guess. I want to be honest, I don't actually know why they make the dinosaurs. I've watched this movie like 10 times and I still don't know the overall purpose of the dinosaurs. And of course, they're stationed in the best place for this, Los Angeles. So when the dinosaurs inevitably escape, they terrorize the city. It's a very simple B-movie plot. There's nothing very special about it, except for the fact that it's unintentionally funny. And it was made by The Asylum, a production studio known for its really bad low-budget knockoff movies that we will be seeing more of in this iceberg. One Million Year B.C. One Million Year B.C. is a British adventure film about a caveman who's exiled from the rock tribe after a scuffle with the leader, and that leads to a, just, just a big old adventure. There are battles against prehistoric creatures, fights with other cavemen, he tries to join another tribe with more advanced people, but he ends up getting banished there as well because he's a speedrunner, I guess. There's really cool stop motion animation here that's also done by Ray Harryhausen, but at the same time, the movie also uses the 
the Slurpasaur method of filmmaking by inserting live animals like an iguana and even a tarantula to pass off as large prehistoric animals, which I pointed out in my video talking about Slurpasaurs. But people in the comments told me that this was used as a way to kind of sort of pay homage to the older dinosaur films, but also to put the Slurpasaurs in the same picture as stop motion animation to essentially prove the latter is superior. Anyways, the movie did very well when it was released. It had a budget of £422,000, which converts to, I think, US dollars correct me if I'm wrong, and in the end, made about $8 million in the box office, making it a success. 1959's Journey to the Center of the Earth this is another film adaptation to the Jules Verne book, but is pretty loose in comparison. In this much earlier version of Journey to the Center of the Earth, a professor and his colleagues travel down an Icelandic volcano that's said to be the entrance to a hidden world within the Earth. Upon reaching the New World, they run into prehistoric creatures in the form of live animals, some of which have more stuff glued onto them, which has to really suck for the animals. And things didn't just suck for the animals, because apparently there was also a raft scene that caused the lead actress, Arlene Dahl, to pass out after filming for that sequence became too much for her. Despite the difficulties, the film would go on to become a financial success and would also be received pretty well, and based on what I've seen, it's remembered pretty well too. Lost Continent Lost Continent is a 1950s dinosaur B-movie that's about an Air Force pilot and his team who are sent on a mission to try and recover an atomic rocket that ends up getting lost over the Pacific Ocean. But as they try searching for it, they crash land on an island. Their search leads them to a mountain that they have to climb in order to reach the rocket, and on top of that mountain, they discover a lost world that contains dinosaurs on it. What's interesting about this film is that, despite what the cover may show, the closest thing to a dangerous carnivorous dinosaur is probably the brontosaurus that attacks the group in the latter half of the movie. Aside from that, the only other prehistoric animals that seem to show up are Triceratops and Pteranodons, which was actually very different to see from a film during this point in time. With the popularity of theropod dinosaurs as a whole, and T-Rex more specifically, you'd think that would be the dinosaur star of the movie. But the most they got out of the T-Rex was essentially just 1950s clickbait, just putting it on the promotional posters and that's about it. It also had some okay stop-motion animation for its dinosaurs, but compared to other movies before its time, it wasn't as clean. 100 Million BC 100 Million BC is a low-budget, direct-to-video movie distributed by the Asylum. The movie is about a group of soldiers on a rescue mission to time travel back to the Cretaceous period to bring back the initial group that was sent back in the 1940s. What's there are crappy CGI dinosaurs. Man, this sucks. They really should just use practical effects for these films. It would look so much better. Holy shit, never mind, please go away. Oh yeah, and Michael Gross is in this movie too for some reason. You know, the dude who played the badass gun nut in the Tremors movies. But I guess he's just used to the whole B-movie thing by now. Gorgo. Gorgo is a giant monster movie that took inspiration from the Godzilla films. In fact, it was intended to be filmed in Japan as a way to pay homage to it, but there were several changes to where the film would take place until it was finally settled to have the setting be in the British Isles. The film also utilizes the man in suit method for the movie monsters, which was a practice that the Godzilla film started. The movie revolves around a group of people who discover a dinosaur-like creature that they call Gorgo, and they sell it to a circus. It's later revealed that this creature was just an infant, and soon its mother emerges from the sea to rescue him from the humans, causing chaos and mass destruction in the process. Cowboys vs. Dinosaurs Cowboys vs. Dinosaurs is a low-budget film that's about, you guessed it, cowboys fighting dinosaurs. There's really not much else to it. The film obviously has other subplots that we're supposed to take seriously, but it's hard to do that when most of it is just cowboys unloading their guns onto hordes of dinosaurs. So basically, a mining company blows up a section of a tunnel they're working in, which releases a massive group of raptors, a triceratops, a T-Rex, that were trapped in there for millions of years. I guess, and they invade a nearby western modern town and kill a bunch of people.
Dinosaurus. Dinosaurus is about a couple of dinosaurs, more specifically a Brontosaurus and a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and a caveman that have been frozen in time and are brought back to life after being uncovered by a nearby engineering team working in the Caribbean and after being struck by lightning. While the Brontosaurus and the caveman seem to be chilling, the T-Rex goes and terrorizes the locals. The effects used for the dinosaurs featured are a combination of stop-motion animation for full body shots and puppets for the close-ups. Prehysteria series. The Prehysteria trilogy is a family comedy series that revolve around miniature dinosaurs that came from a temple in South America as eggs but were smuggled back to a museum in the States. The eggs hatch and among the clutch are five different mini dinosaurs, a T-Rex, a Brachiosaurus, a Stegosaurus, a Chasmosaurus, and a Geosternbergia. Fun fact, I saw this movie when I was little and I always, for whatever reason, thought these dinosaurs were supposed to be inanimate toys that were just somehow brought to life. But based on the descriptions I'm reading on this film now, these are supposed to be real dinosaurs in the movie and these are just their natural sizes. However, the most interesting thing about this movie to me has to be the fact that it was made by the company Moonbeam Entertainment, which is the family subsidiary to the Full Moon Entertainment Company that's responsible for all of those crappy horror B-movies like Ginger Dead Man, Demonic Toys, Evil Bong, and we can't forget the Puppet Master franchise. It's almost surreal to see that Full Moon Entertainment had a subsidiary company dedicated for a more family-based audience. I don't know, to me, it just makes it seem like Prehysteria was essentially a kid-friendly dinosaur equivalent of the horror movies from their main company. Poseidon Rex Poseidon Rex is a low-budget science fiction movie that involves a group of treasure hunters trying to find ancient Mayan treasure off the coast of Belize, but instead awaken aquatic semi-terrestrial dinosaur that resembles something close to a T-Rex, which ends up terrorizing a nearby town. I will say it's a very interesting and I will even say somewhat unique plot uh, compared to some of the other Dinosaur B movies out there because actually never mind uh, now that I'm thinking about it there is another Dinosaur Aquatic B movie I think it's called Dino Shark so never mind this movie is not at all unique uh, it, it's it's not that interesting so there's not really much else to say about it. Planet of Dinosaurs Planet of Dinosaurs is set in the future where a crew of people in a spaceship crash land on a planet inhabited by dinosaurs. During the movie, the characters run into some of the prehistoric wildlife where they are able to discern that the planet is following a similar evolutionary path to that of Earth, but is just millions and millions of years behind. Their initial plan is to try and contact for help to get off the planet, but after an attack from the Tyrannosaurus Rex, they realize their best shot of survival is to kill the dinosaur. This was an independent film that had a very low budget and since a lot of it went towards the special effects, there were barely enough to pay the actors with. So in the end, they didn't really get that much out of it and the film didn't have very positive reviews. Anytime something good was said about the film, it was mainly targeted at the stop motion effects it provided for the dinosaurs. And hey, there was even a neat little Retosaurus cameo which was the fictional dinosaur monster that featured in the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. However, in the scene that features it, it ends up getting killed by the T-Rex. F in the chat for our boy Retosaurus, he didn't deserve to go out this way. Anyways, everything else including the acting and the dialogue was not held in very high regard, but nowadays it does seem to be considered a cult classic by many. When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth during the late 60s and early 70s, a British film production company known as Hammer Films Productions released a series of movies they called the Cave Girl series. One of the movies we talked about here already, One Million Years BC, was actually a part of this series. But along with that was When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. In this movie, a tribe of cave people sacrifice blonde women to their sun god because they believe it protects them from the prehistoric animals that they live around. During one of these rituals, one of the women finds an opportunity to escape from the tribe and now has to survive the world of dinosaurs and other prehistoric threats. 
Adventures in Dinosaur City. Adventures in Dinosaur City is a very weird family movie about a trio of kids who want to watch their favorite TV show, which is about cavemen and anthropomorphic dinosaurs, and they try to watch it in one of their scientist parents' basements, only to accidentally get themselves sucked into a vortex which their parents were experimenting with that sends them into the world of their TV show. Here they meet up and befriend some of the characters, which is a T-Rex, a Protoceratops, and a Rampharynchus. And together, they have to stop the Allosaurus bad guy, whose name is Mr. Big, from, you know, doing bad guy things. Dinosaur City was a result of the early 90s kids movie hype caused by the hugely successful Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie from 1990. But not much came from it aside from mixed reviews and a video game for the SNES under the title of Dino City. Jurassic City Jurassic City is a low-budget dinosaur mockbuster film that features monolophosauruses terrorizing a prison because they can't actually budget for them terrorizing a whole city. Anyways, within the prison are a small group of sorority girls that were brought there after partying a little too hard and are now trapped in a prison with the remaining prisoners and bloodthirsty dinosaurs. There's not much about this film, aside from the fact that it's obviously just trying to use the Jurassic name to capitalize off of it. As you can tell, it's just another crappy B-movie that most people just don't like due to its lazy story and bad CGI. 2009's The Land That Time Forgot in 2009, the Asylum decided to make their own rendition of Edgar Rice Burroughs' book, The Land That Time Forgot. What resulted was this 2009 movie, one with bad CGI and a plot similar to the one that we covered earlier. Except this time, it revolves around a newlywed couple getting lost on their boat during a storm and ending up by the island of Caprona, which is said to be within the Bermuda Triangle. Near the island, they find a crew of people within a stranded U-boat, and both groups have to work together to survive on the island that is inhabited by dinosaurs. In the end, the U-boat does make it out of the island, leaving behind our two newlywed main characters, but it's unknown if they ever reach civilization. My Pet Dinosaur my Pet Dinosaur is an Australian family movie that was directed by Matt Drummond, the same guy who directed 2014's Dinosaur Island, which was his directorial debut. After the turnout for that film, he would go on to create My Pet Dinosaur in 2017. This movie revolves around a kid who makes a strange discovery in the form of a weird-looking dinosaur. Things only get more tense with the dinosaur's unusually quick growth spurts and the involvement of the military. I actually haven't seen the movie myself yet, but I sense a lot of Super 8 vibes just from watching the trailer. The Beast of Hollow Mountain the Beast of Hollow Mountain is considered to be the first western movie to feature a dinosaur. It's about a white cowboy attempting to run a cattle ranch in Mexico, but due to his conflicts with one caballero who's engaged to his love interest and his cattle mysteriously disappearing, his chances on keeping his ranch are slim. Most of the movie is focused on the love triangle between the main protagonist and the main human antagonist, along with showcasing some of the more western elements as well. It actually it actually isn't until a full hour in we finally get to see the dinosaur that's responsible for all of the missing cattle. So now our characters have to try to stop the animal from causing any more death to both the cattle and the locals. Earlier I had mentioned that Willis O'Brien had been trying to get the idea of a cowboy and dinosaur movie off the ground but never managed to succeed in that during his lifetime. Despite that, Ray Harryhausen would finally make Valley of Gowanji in his honor, but before he did that, there was a period where the idea for this film would be tossed around and would eventually land in the hands of the people who would eventually make The Beast of Hollow Mountain. They really liked O'Brien's idea and they tried their hand at making it come to fruition and while it wasn't nearly as cool as what it sounded like on paper, it wasn't the worst attempt at a dinosaur western film, especially when you have things like dinosaurs versus cowboys nowadays. I'll definitely talk about its history more in depth one of these days when I redo my dinosaur western video, but it's just just so much for this already long ass video. King Dinosaur 
King Dinosaur is another low-budget film, this time from the 50s, and also features live animals that it passes off as dinosaurs. The movie takes place in 1960, five years from the point it was being created, and revolves around four explorers who venture to a newly discovered planet called Nova that just kind of enters their solar system. Upon arriving, they realize that it holds a lot of qualities that are similar to that of Earth, but is home to large prehistoric and alien animals like giant insects and giant giant reptiles. There's really not much to this one, probably because it didn't really have anything that made it very unique. I mean, the concept is definitely interesting, but the execution was considered to be pretty mid by many. The Dinosaur Experiment also known as Raptor Ranch, this is yet another Dinosaur B movie with very shitty CGI. This time, it's about a group of people who have to survive a bunch of dinosaurs that came from what was thought to be a cattle ranch, but is actually a place where a crazy old man had been using to breed dinosaurs in. I mean, there's not much to say about this one either. It's basically like Age of Dinosaurs, but instead of being set in California, it's just set in Texas. And the outcome of the dinosaurs rampaging the city is not nearly as entertaining. The movie just sticks with the horror movie formula of having the dinosaurs constantly following and hunting the main characters, and that's about it. 1940s 1 million BC. Earlier, we talked about the 1966 movie 1 million years BC. I totally forgot to mention that that movie was actually a remake to this 1940s version, which is originally titled 1 million BC. The remake somewhat follows the original, but there are some telling differences. For example, the movie starts off with a prologue set in modern times about a group of hikers, one of them being an anthropologist, having to temporarily seek shelter inside a cave during a storm. After finding cave markings, the anthropologist begins to decipher a story out of them. From here, we transition to the actual story of a caveman who is thrown out of his tribe by his own father and now has to survive on his own in the prehistoric world dominated by dinosaurs and other giant reptiles. That is, until he finds a more advanced tribe that has a less savage way of living that he now has to adjust to. There were a couple of different methods used for the dinosaurs in this film. The movie was an early example of the use of the man in suit method, since there was a man in an allosaurus suit for one scene, but for the other creatures, they opted to use live animals. Like using a pig in a triceratops suit and covering an elephant in full fur to pass it off as a mammoth. Then there was the use of reptiles to pass them off as dinosaurs, like an alligator or caiman with a sail on its back, and to make things even worse for the animals, they were forced to fight each other for the movie as well. In this particular case, the cruel treatment of the animals would actually get the attention of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals to ban the scenes depicting the mistreatment of the reptiles. However, this had little effect on the situation as these scenes, along with other parts of the movie, would be used as stock footage for tons of other films, some of which I've talked about already and others that will probably get brought up as we continue. 1994's Dinosaur Island 1994's Dinosaur Island is a B-movie about a small group of army men who crash land on an island of more than half-naked cave women who make sacrifices to please the Great One, which is what they call the T-Rex here. The movie is said to have been made right after the announcement of the Jurassic Park movie, but the film's co-director Jim Wynorski says that it wasn't meant to be a rip-off of the film, but rather just a cave woman movie. And he isn't wrong about that statement because, you know, a cave woman movie is, uh, it's, it's kind of different from Jurassic Park. I guess depending on what version of the movie you have, there's an uncensored one out there that features a lot of nudity and even a sex scene. Listen, YouTube, this is purely for educational purposes. Surely for that reason alone, I could show some of the sex scene here, right? 1992's The Lost World The Lost World 1992 is another film adaptation to the 1912 book, but this time it was just a TV movie. In this one, a scientist explorer named Professor Challenger, which I'm gonna be honest, reading back on this, I don't, I think this is literally the first time I'm mentioning that name. Professor Challenger has been a character in all of these other movies too, and in the original books. I'm, I'm surprised I haven't mentioned his name yet. Anyways, uh, Professor Challenger claims he's attempting to discover a lost world that he says is located somewhere in Central Africa, which is a statement that's garnered him nothing but mockery and ridiculed by other scientists. 
he ends up going on this expedition to Africa to prove that his hidden world is real. He does manage to do this, but they end up stranding themselves here and now have to avoid and fend against dinosaurs and hostile natives. While the movie follows the basic plots from the book, there are some extreme differences, for example, the setting. Instead of South America, the Lost World is in Africa, and instead of cavemen or Neanderthal tribes attacking the group, it's an African tribe. Apparently, there were also differences in regards to the characters, as some were completely new to the story and others weren't used at all. Along with that, another major difference is that this movie had a sequel to it, which is called Return to the Lost World, that was released in the same year and apparently has nothing to do with the book. Raptor Raptor is another Jim Wynorski directed film that I initially thought was supposed to be some sort of spin-off to the Carnosaur series, but it just looks like it's supposed to be its own standalone film that simply reuses footage from Carnosaur, which is probably why I thought that in the first place. It was produced by Roger Corman, who had previously also worked on the Carnosaur films, so that explains the connection between the two. But this one is about a pair of cops who are looking into a string of animal attacks that end up being from genetically engineered dinosaurs running loose in the streets and created by a mad scientist who used to work for the military. So basically, it's a pretty unimaginative and generic dinosaur B-movie, and aside from its association from Carnosaurs, it doesn't really have anything else unique about it. About it. Reptilicus Reptilicus is a Danish-American monster movie about miners that discover the tale of some sort of large ancient animal. So they bring it back to their base of operations where they accidentally thaw it out, which causes it to regenerate into a giant reptilian serpent that ends up breaking out. Soon the monster is causing mass destruction to the nearby city and battling military troops that are unable to stop it using their usual weaponry. There were actually two versions of this film that were shot in a very unconventional conventional and difficult way. There were two directors, one for the Danish version, which was Paul Bang, and the other for the American version, which was Sidney W. Pink. They ended up filming both of them simultaneously. According to the Our Culture article on this, Danish and English versions were shot simultaneously, with the cast performing in both languages. Pink would direct his version of a scene, and then the film's Danish director, Paul Bang, would rearrange the camera and lighting setups for his version. And it seems like both versions were edited slightly differently as well. Regardless, the movie has faced a lot of criticism for being a lame monster movie with bad effects. Aztec Rex Aztec Rex takes place in the early 1500s and is about a group of conquistadors traveling overseas to a new land only to discover the Aztec society, who are at the mercy of a pair of tyrannosaurs that they worship and sacrifice people for. For as awful as this movie is with its low quality effects for the T-Rex, it's cool to see they filmed in Kualoa Ranch, which is the same place they shot some of Jurassic Park in. And that's not the only thing these two films have in common, because one of the actresses who plays in Aztec Rex, Deechin Lockman, actually features in Jurassic World Dominion, the newest installment to the Jurassic World trilogy. Anyways, it's a shame this movie is just another low-budget B-movie, but what makes it unique than other B-movies is that it injects dinosaurs into this historical event that seems almost kind of fitting for it. Maybe it's just because I think the concept is cool and should be explored more but that's just me. The Dinosaur Project The Dinosaur Project is a found footage dinosaur film that's about a group of explorers from the British Cryptozoology Society and a couple of camera guys who venture out into the deep African jungles in search of the famous legend Mokele Mbembe, which is depicted as a plesiosaur in this film for some reason. That's definitely an interesting choice considering most depictions of the Mokele is a semi-aquatic sauropod-like dinosaur as I mentioned earlier. Anyway, during this search, the group also run into to and document other prehistoric wildlife that they also have to survive from. While the film doesn't hold the best ratings, I actually really like this movie, mainly because it shows that dinosaurs blended in with the found footage genre isn't that bad if done correctly. I mean, it's definitely better than some of the other found footage films we'll be seeing here later on in the list, but I actually do like the found footage genre because if done properly, it has the potential to come out feeling very realistic and the incorporation of dinosaurs in it just sounds awesome to me. 
Dinosaur Hotel. Dinosaur Hotel is another more modern dinosaur B-movie that's based around a group of people who are partaking in an underground game show where the contestants have to survive in a hotel infested with dinosaurs for 24 hours. The winner gets a cash prize of a million dollars and the show is ran by wealthy people who get entertainment out of watching poor people suffer. But based on what I'm reading about it, it pretty much has all of the qualities you'd expect from dinosaur B-movie schlock. Triassic World Triassic World is an asylum-made dinosaur movie from 2018, most likely as a way to capitalize off of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. And if you thought Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom was bad, Triassic World is somehow worse. Triassic World is about a company that found a way to grow human organs inside live dinosaurs that they also managed to create, which they plan to harvest out of them to sell and make money off of. Of course, the dinosaurs, which are said to be Gorgirosauruses, so, you know, one point for originality, I guess, break out and roam around the research facility they're kept in, devouring anyone they run into. Now our group of characters have to try and find a way out, while at the same time not let these guys loose from the facility. The movie would go on to get a sequel called Triassic Hunt, which doesn't seem like it has much to do with Triassic World. Triassic Hunt is about a group of mercenaries having to hunt down two genetically engineered dinosaurs dinosaurs on the loose in the city. But the dinosaurs have human-like intelligence, so it presents an even bigger problem for the characters. Unknown Island Unknown Island is an adventure film about a US pilot that claimed he saw dinosaurs while flying his plane over a mysterious island in World War II and is determined to find them again to confirm their existence. During the present, he and his fiancée are able to get a ship captain to take them to this island where they find a new undiscovered world dominated by prehistoric animals with the main dinosaur carnivores being ceratosaurs. Also, there's a ground sloth in this film and uh... It looks like this. Also, according to IMDb, this movie used the man in suit method, and one of the guys in the dinosaur suit actually collapsed from heat exhaustion due to this movie being filmed out in a desert and them having to be in those rubber suits. He would later die from this, but there's a scene where one of the ceratosaurs collapses from a grenade explosion that's said to be the guy that fell from heat exhaustion, but despite the circumstances, it was just kept in the movie anyways. I don't know how true that is though, since the sources for this are pretty limited and aren't backed up by any evidence, so take it with a grain of salt. So after looking through the dinosaur filmography, I actually did find the segment on Unknown Island and it does state that there was a man that did collapse from heat exhaustion, however, it wasn't specified whether or not he died. So that's still kind of up in the air and should be taken with a grain of salt, but uh, yeah, I thought I'd just mention that just, just in case. Moving on. The Eden Formula. The Eden Formula, also known by its much stupider name Tyrannosaurus Rex, it's about scientists who've developed a new chemical that has the ability to recreate any living organism, including dinosaurs. In fact, they've already created a Tyrannosaurus Rex out of it. But this is a dinosaur movie, so obviously it means the T-Rex will escape and eventually be loose in the city. But not before some corporate espionage takes place first, because as you could have guessed already, this chemical is in high demand and there are plenty of people out out there that want to get their hands on it. The movie is just garbage, there's nothing noteworthy about it, it doesn't even use its own dinosaurs, a lot of the footage is just recycled from the Carnosaur films. The most I could say about this movie is that for some reason, Tony Todd's in it, the dude who played the original Candyman. The Crater Lake Monster the Crater Lake Monster is a movie about a small town in Northern California being terrorized by a plesiosaur-like monster from the nearby lake, which hatched from a long dormant egg, which apparently was waiting for the right natural condition to hatch in the first place. This condition, based on what I've read and what I remember, was literally the temperature of the lake, which was warmed up after a meteor crashed into it. So now, a sheriff, some locals, and some scientists have to try and stop the monster from killing more people. The movie is known for its bad qualities, like the bad acting, questionable logic, and horrible editing. Which was in part due to Crown International, an independent film company that ended up screwing up the finances for the film, leading to little to no work being done for the film in post-production, adding on to why it looks like shit. Of course, one of the few good things about it is the stop-motion animation for the full body shots for the quote-unquote dinosaur. Two Lost Worlds 
Two Lost Worlds is a very interesting film that takes place in 1830 where a group of people on a ship are attacked by pirates. When the damsels in distress characters are taken by them, the men from the ship that was attacked pursue them and end up on an island full of prehistoric animals. I thought this film was interesting until I found out it just reuses footage from another dinosaur film that I already talked about, which was 1 million BC, and they aren't even on screen for very long. In fact, I don't think any original footage for the dinosaurs was made for this film. But correct me if I'm wrong about that, of course. Plus, the film is just a culmination of a lot of things put together. There's pirates, a love triangle, a mysterious island with quote-unquote dinosaurs. It's got the romance and the drama and the sci-fi adventure, yet from what I've seen in terms of reviews, it falls really flat. The most consistent criticism I found on this film was how it pretty much had nothing to do with dinosaurs, yet that's what the movie posters indicated. Triassic Attack Triassic Attack is a TV movie about a university that bought out a bunch of land that they intend to destroy so that they can expand their property, which angers a local Native American who decides to use ancient magic that summons three demons who possess dinosaur skeletons that go and attack anyone they encounter. As bad as this concept sounds, I have to hand it to the people who made this film because it's definitely a lot more different than what we usually see when it comes to these B-movies. Also, for those of you that talk about how the majority of the dinosaurs featured in Jurassic Park are not actually from the Jurassic, guess how many dinosaurs in this movie are in the Triassic period? I won't say anything, but of the three dinosaur skeletons we have, we have a T-Rex, a Velociraptor, and a Pteranodon. Where Time Began where Time Began is the Spanish adaptation of Journey to the Center of the Earth, which is actually the original title in its country of origin. It has a few versions of its name depending on the region you're watching in. In the UK, it's known as the Fabulous Journey to the Center of the Earth. And in the US, it's known as Where Time Began. And at this point, you all should know the base story for Journey to the Center of the Earth. A group of explorers want to go to the center of the earth and they discover a hidden world teeming with prehistoric life, which comes in the form of dinosaur-like sea monsters. However, this version does have some unique elements to it that makes it different between itself and the source material. For some reason, a gorilla and giant tortoises are kind of thrown into the movie for very minor parts, along with the inclusion of a time-traveling scientist. The movie sounds very weird and cheesy, but I kind of want to watch it now. The Jurassic Games In the future, criminals on death row are put in a virtual reality simulation to take part in the Jurassic Games, which puts them in a prehistoric scenario where they have to avoid getting killed by both dinosaurs and each other. Last one alive gets to go free. All of this is done to kill two birds with one stone, it punishes the convicts for the crimes they've committed, and the games can be viewed as entertainment for others. One convict, who is our main character, has been wrongfully accused of his crime but is put through the games anyways, so now has to try to survive the dinosaurs and other prisoners while trying to simultaneously clear his name. This film is a pretty interesting entry because it has a very B-movie concept, but its execution and overall quality is not really that bad. Yeah, it's no masterpiece and it's a pretty campy film in some parts, but overall, the way it's presented and its production value definitely makes it more watchable than most B-movies out there. Plus, the film's been compared to things like The Running Man, The Hunger Games, The Most Dangerous Game, and of course, Jurassic Park. Attack of the Super Monsters Attack of the Super Monsters is a film that was compiled together from the first four episodes of a Japanese-produced TV show called Dinosaur War Eisenborg, I guess, I don't know. Both are about dinosaurs making a return to Earth as much stronger and more intelligent creatures that plan to take over the planet and wipe out humanity, which are led by the evil dinosaur leader, Tyrannus, who looks oddly familiar. It seems that this guy's suit also featured in a previous movie we've already talked about, The Last Dinosaur. Which makes sense because that film was co-produced by this movie studio, which also produced this movie and show as well. The film utilizes both 2D animation for the characters and live action props for the set pieces and dinosaurs for its story. Jurassic Galaxy 
Man, I forgot how many dinosaur films came out in 2018, but I'm not surprised. A lot of them, including this one, were low-budget movies just trying to capitalize off of a specific title that was relevant that year. Anyways, Jurassic Galaxy is a low-budget science fiction movie that takes place in the future, where a group of people who were working on a spaceship crash land on an undiscovered island, wait, island? Planet? Crash land on an undiscovered planet that is roamed by dinosaurs. Really, this just sounds like a knockoff of Planet of Dinosaurs more than Jurassic World, but we can't forget this totally unique raptor design that totally wasn't copying another raptor from a pre-existing movie at all. Like, why would they do that? That's not, that, what, what? They would never. I kind of remember watching this movie, and if I'm correct, there's also this weird subplot where the long you are on the planet, the more aggressive and feral you turn, but I could be wrong about that. Regardless, it's just not a very good movie. Extinction Extinction is a found footage, or I guess mockumentary film, that's meant to be a documentary of a team of researchers going on an expedition to the Amazon in order to find a rare species of animal, only to be left behind by their guides and now have to fend for themselves when they find out that this rare animal is a carnivorous dinosaur that's hunting them. There's not much I could find interesting about this film, aside from the surprising use of practical effects for the dinosaur, which is not great, but considering the style of the movie, it looks like it could probably work, if they maybe tried a little bit more. The Jurassic Dead the Jurassic Dead is yet another low-budget dinosaur movie made by Wild Eye Releasing, an independent movie production company that's known for their extensive catalog of low-budget horror and science fiction movies. Some notable examples of these are things like Jurassic Prey and The Amazing Bulk. The Jurassic Dead is about a team of soldiers that have to take down a zombified T-Rex that was brought to life by a mad scientist that just wants to end the world through his organization called Axis of Evil. It is truly the cinematic experience you'll ever have in your life. The Land Unknown the Land Unknown is about an Antarctic naval expedition sent out to find the cause for the unusually warm waters near the area, only for things to go horribly wrong as the group making this trip crash land into a large volcanic crater that contains an unexplored world of dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. This movie actually uses like a bunch of different ways to bring their dinosaurs to life. There's the use of live animals, which are monitor lizards in this movie. There's also the man in suit method, for its main dinosaur, the Tyrannosaurus rex. And I believe there's also an animatronic of an elasmosaur or some kind of plesiosaur that's used later in the film as well. From what I've seen from a few sources, it's said that this film was Universal's most expensive one for the time, but despite that, some cuts were made, which stopped the film from completing some of the original plans the filmmakers had for it, like displaying it in Technicolor. I don't know if that would have helped this movie though, because it's heavily criticized on its dull attempt at being just another Lost World movie. Lost in Dinosaur World Lost in Dinosaur World is a cheesy 90s kids movie or short film about a pair of siblings who go to a dinosaur theme park with their parents only to get lost and encounter a Tyrannosaurus Rex. By the way the movie is portrayed, it almost feels like it's supposed to be some kind of informational or documentary style movie, which makes sense considering the overall premise and its source material. Because this was actually a movie adaptation of a children's book written by Joffrey T. Williams, who had it originally published in 1987. Because of this, Williams wasn't too happy to hear that Michael Crichton had also published a book about the same basic concept of a dinosaur theme park three years after his was published, and was probably even more upset that it was getting a movie adaptation for it in 1993. This was something that was taken to court, but Crichton and Spielberg would come out victorious. Then, in the same year, the Lost in Dinosaur World movie would come out. I actually have like a full-length video about this whole situation, so if you want to go watch that, I'll leave it in the description down below. Also, the dinosaurs used for the Lost in Dinosaur World movie are the animatronic dinosaurs that were made from the Dynamation Company, who were also in competition with Jurassic Park and its revolutionary special effects at the time. It almost makes me think this whole thing was created out of spite. But hey, while I'm on the topic of shouting out my older content, Content, uh, I also made a video on Dynamation and their downfall. So if you want to see that, that video will also be in the description down below. Dinosaur from the Deep 
Man, we're just revisiting all sorts of dinosaur movies today, aren't we? Dinosaur from the Deep is a French science fiction movie that was so low budget and so poorly made that it has gone beyond the levels of B-movie status and is considered to be a Z-movie, which are a real thing. But the person behind this, Norbert Moutier, clearly has or had a passion for these kinds of movies and was known to make multiple of them and of the same quality. So when Jurassic Park would eventually come out in the early 90s, he decided to put his Z movie making skills towards making Dinosaur from the Deep as a way to capitalize off of it. This is just another one of those movies that I covered on the channel a while back ago that will also be in the description down below, I guess. Why don't I just put all of the videos I made a few years back in the description down below? That way you guys just don't miss anything. <laughs> the movie takes place in the future, where the death penalty is no longer legal. So the FBI decide to join a group of scientists on a time-traveling mission to the past to when it was still legal so that they can take out a criminal they manage to apprehend. The reason why the scientists are going is to get a closer look at real-life dinosaurs, which is what they end up running into. Soon, they're being eaten by a shitty-looking T-Rex one by one. Well, shitty as in, like, the close-up shots of the head is shitty and the stop-motion is also pretty bad. But there are certain scenes for the movie where they actually use, like, a T-Rex toy for full body shots. And I didn't realize this then, but people in the comment section pointed out that that was actually actually a Dino Riders T-Rex toy. If you want to know more about the movie, just go watch my video on it because it, the movie's actually kind of funny. Voyage to Prehistoric Planet from when Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet was made, it takes place in the future in 2020, where a group of space explorers venture to Venus only to discover a prehistoric world. This movie has a very strange backstory. Apparently, it was a slightly edited version of a Russian-made movie called Planeta Burr. So what ended up happening was that Roger Corman, you know, the guy who's been a part of all of these other dinosaur projects that I've talked about already, ended up taking this movie and instead of just recreating his own version of it, he essentially just reused the entire thing and re-edited it in a way that made it look like an American production. There were parts that were shot and edited with American actress Faith Demure and English actor Basil Rathbone, and the original credits were replaced with fake American names. Basically, Corman just took the laziest route to quote-unquote make a movie, and even saying that feels generous. Yungu and Princess Zuzu. Yungu and Princess Zuzu is a weird Korean made dinosaur film about a boy named Yungu who seems to be some sort of recurring comedic character that features in multiple other movies that also have crazy premises like this one. Anyways, this boy, who I think is played by the director of this movie himself, comes across an egg that hatches a baby dinosaur named Zuzu to which he befriends. The two are kidnapped by the movie's villains, but all of this comes to a head when Zuzu's mother comes into the picture and wreaks havoc in search of her young. This is basically just another giant kaiju monster movie that was directed by the same dude who directed Dragon Wars and Tyranno's Claw, which is another movie we're going to look at here soon. Area 407 Area 407 is probably the worst example of a found footage dinosaur movie, which is based around passengers who are on an airplane that crashes into a government testing area and are hunted by dinosaurs that I guess were created by the government or something, I don't know. I haven't really seen the movie in a long time, but I remember it being just really bad. The found footage slash mockumentary genre is a genre that's criticized a lot because of how it presents its visuals to the audience, to the point where people just just full on hate it. However, if it's done right, it has the potential to result in very realistic and genuinely terrifying movies. But movies like Area 407 just further give it a bad name. There was also going to be a part 2, I guess, to this movie that was going to involve dinosaurs as well, but it was also going to throw in some zombies in there too, I guess to further emphasize the kind of testing the government is doing in the lab. I don't really know a whole lot about it because it's not something that actually came to fruition. However, there was a trailer released for it and um it, it's it's bad it's it's really bad jurassic attack Jurassic Attack, or Rise of the Dinosaurs, is another low-budget creature feature that's about a group of soldiers on a mission to free a hostage from terrorists that end up crash-landing on a dinosaur island. 
At this point, I really don't know what to say about these kind of movies anymore. A lot of them are just the same thing with very little unique history tied to their names. Jurassic Attack is just one of these movies. There's nothing interesting about it, and there's nothing more to say about it. Return of the Dinosaurs Return of the Dinosaurs is an anime TV show turned movie after the producers wanted to create a version for it for the English-speaking market. The director of the special effects for the Ultraman show, Koichi Takano, if I mispronounced that, blame the internet, that's how it told me to say it, decided to take a break from that project to instead work on this show, which was cut and put together as a 1 hour and 20 minute movie. After a comet passes close by to Earth, it somehow resurrects the Mesozoic era, including the dinosaurs that lived in it. However, the dinosaurs begin to die off under the climate conditions, so the human characters are on a mission to rescue whatever dinosaurs they can. It's another one of those movies that combined a 2D anime style animation with live action practical effects like stop motion and puppets. A Journey to the Beginning of Time in what sounds like a pretty unique and interesting story, A Journey to the Beginning of Time is a Czech movie about four kids that go on a trip down the River of Time, which takes them through a cave entrance and out of the other side transports them into a prehistoric world that gets progressively farther back in time as they continue. This gives them the opportunity to see dinosaurs in the flesh, which were brought to life using practical effects like stop-motion animations, along with recreating full-size dinosaurs for certain scenes. For example, there is a scene with a dead stegosaurus that the kids inspect, which was a full-size model of one. The film definitely has an experimental feel to it since it didn't just feel like a movie, but rather it seems like a hybrid between a science fiction story and a documentary by the way it's presented. The director of the film, Carol Zeman, was also inspired by the works of paleo artist Zdenek Burian, whose style for the dinosaurs in his artwork were recreated for the ones in this movie. Valley of the Dragons Valley of the Dragons is a science fiction movie that's a very loose adaptation to another Jules Verne book called Off on a Comet. And when I say loose, I mean it. Just from reading the descriptions between these two works, they almost sound nothing alike. Valley of the Dragons takes place in 1881, where a pair of men were about to duel until a comet passes by very close to Earth sweeping the two off the face of the planet and transporting them in a prehistoric world with dinosaurs and two rival cave tribes. With the dinosaurs being considered this world's dragons, hence why it's called Valley of the Dragons. And this is another movie that reuses footage from the 1940 1 million BC movie, and even a little bit from Rodan, but that's most likely done for budget reasons. As far as the original 1877 book goes, from what I've been able to find out about it, it is about a comet that grazes Earth's surface, collecting 36 people who work together to form a small community on it after they find out the comet will take two years to orbit back to Earth. As far as I'm concerned, the story has no mention of dinosaurs or cave people and is more of a journey through space kind of story than a dinosaur one. But this actually has a bunch of story to it. The reason why this movie adaptation was very different from the original source material was because the director, Al Zimbalist, was essentially trying to kill two birds with one stone. Zimbalist's son had discovered this not very well-known Jules Verne book that was apparently never released in the US. But this didn't really matter because at the time Jules Verne was becoming big with movie adaptations on his popular works and Off the Comet was in public domain, meaning Zimbalist could make a film adaptation to it and bank off of Verne's name. However, he also had the rights to footage from the 1 million BC movie, so he decided to take both of these things and combine it together to what is now known today as the Valley of Dragons. Planet Raptor Planet Raptor is a made-for-TV movie that initially aired on the Sci-Fi Channel and was actually the sequel to Raptor Island. Raptor Island is about a group of Navy SEALs on a rescue mission that takes them to an island where an airplane containing nuclear waste had crashed on, which caused some of the animals within the region to be mutated into raptor-like dinosaurs that they now have to fight off along with completing their mission. Raptor Planet seems like it's kind of the same thing, but on a grander scale. A team of space soldiers explore a mysterious planet that has raptors on it that were bred by aliens. Okay, never mind. This doesn't sound even close to the same thing, but in case you couldn't tell already, it's just a crazy dumb fun ride in typical B-movie fashion. A Nymphoid Barbarian in Dinosaur Hell 
A nymphoid barbarian in Dinosaur Hell is about the last woman on Earth surviving in a post-apocalyptic wasteland dominated by cavemen, mutants, and dinosaurs, to which they all desire her in one way or another. Initially, this movie wasn't going to be about any of this and had a different title called Dark Fortress. But this went through a couple of different changes and somewhere along the way, the movie's director, Brett Piper, wanted to see if he could make a movie in the same vein as a Ray Harryhausen film one with monsters in our modern world brought to life through special effects. However, the budget was low and the final product didn't seem to do that well. Tyrannos Claw So this is actually the movie's original title, but I just call it Tyrannos Claw because it's easier. It's a South Korean ahistorical movie that was directed by Shim Hyung Rae, who I mentioned earlier about a caveman living in the time of dinosaurs. More specifically, it's about one caveman who is a part of a tribe that worships and performs ritual sacrifices to a giant T-Rex, and is ran by a barbaric and ruthless leader. When the main caveman tries to defend himself and his love interest, both make their escape from the tribe that chases after them through the prehistoric jungles containing dinosaurs, giant rats, and ape-like cannibals. Despite being a cheesy and campy movie in some parts, this one's actually not that bad. Personally, I enjoyed it when I watched it for a video that I did about it a while back ago. Hell yeah, more shameless plugins for older projects that you guys should definitely check out. <laughs> But for real, I did actually do a video on this movie and it does go more in depth behind the backstory and the movie itself, so if you want to know more about it, go ahead and check out that video. Planeta Burr. I don't even know if I'm even saying that right, so if I'm not, sorry. Anyways, earlier I had mentioned that Roger Corman was a part of another dinosaur project called Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet which was basically a re-edited version of an already existing Russian movie, which was called Planeta Burr, which this edited version was actually supposed to serve as an American version of that film, I guess, since the original version had never released to the US. Planeta Burr is about a group of people flying a trio of ships towards Venus with the intent of exploring the planet. After one of the ships is destroyed by a meteor and the rest have to wait for a third ship from Earth to complete the mission, they make the decision to land on the planet anyways where they discover a strange world with prehistoric fauna and flora but along the way they also make other interesting discoveries that presents an interesting twist to the story. I won't say much here though, sorry. Untamed Women and our final entry from this list, we have Untamed Women, a story about an American soldier's journey after he and a few of his team managed to survive crashing at sea and making their way to a mysterious island by lifeboat. Once there, they discover a new world containing dinosaurs and a tribe of cave women, which are from druid descent, whose male partners were all killed by a Neanderthal tribe that intends to kidnap the cave women to breed with them. The soldiers face threats from all around with the untrusting cavewomen tribe, the savage Neanderthal tribe, and the brutal nature of the prehistoric world. The way the story is told is that the whole thing is basically a flashback being told to us by the main character who ended up getting saved, was brought back to a military hospital, and is forced to give up information of the events that had occurred. A lot of the footage for the dinosaurs and some of the prehistoric backgrounds are reused from, you guessed it, 1940s 1 million in BC. And with this being yet another B-movie, it's not surprising that it holds a mediocre score for being a just overall poorly made film. But one thing that I guess gives it merit is that it's very campy and pulpy to the point that people seem to enjoy it enough to watch it. Whew, alright, that was the dinosaur movie Iceberg, and of course it took me a lot longer to get through than I initially thought. Keep in mind, this is obviously not the most definitive or complete list. There are tons of dinosaur movies that I know of that were not a part of this iceberg, so I'm not opposed to doing maybe a second one later on, but this was a lot to get through, so I'll just leave it here. There were some people that were asking me both in the comments section of my videos and in my Discord server what I was going to do for, for Dinosaur Month or for Jurassic June or whatever, whatever the hell you guys call this month <laughs> for dinosaurs. I don't know. I don't pay attention to that stuff. I just make videos, all right? Uh, consider this the official video for Dinosaur Month, I guess. I do have another one coming out. Uh, I don't know if it's going to come out this month because uh, it's it's another big one. So it might come out this month. It might wait till next month. I'm not sure. In case you're wondering, it's the Winter in Eden video, which is the sequel to West of Eden, um, which I'm sure some of you guys are 
looking forward to that because I've been seeing comments about that series as well. So I plan on fin I plan on continuing it at least. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much all I have to say for now in terms of this video and just future updates for the channel. Thank you all so much for watching. I am very tired. There was a lot to record and I have a lot to edit. <laughs> but um, oh yeah, real quick, I, speaking of editing, I do want to just thank Pish real quick for helping me edit some of the some of the entries here. Without his help, this video would be very much delayed and it would have been very stressful to make. And yeah, overall, just thank you so much to my friend Pish for helping me edit some of this video go check out his channel. His links will be down in the description below. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you guys so much for watching and please have a nice day.